Hello, everyone. World famous Settlers Lament back here again with the hopefully soon legally mandatory CanCon broadcast. Uh, today, we're going to be discussing an article from George Grant from 1943 called Canada, an Introduction to a Nation. For those of you who aren't already familiar, George Grant, we've talked about him on the channel before, especially in the other CanCon streams. Uh, he was a, a, a very influential and important Canadian conservative philosopher. He most famously, as we have previously discussed, wrote a Lament for a Nation from, 19, from 1965. Is that when it was published? Did, did, does anyone know this off the top of their head? I want to say 1965. From what year the Lament for a Nation was published? Yeah, yeah. I think it would have been 63, but... I mean, I, I know it was in response to the... Um, to the election, but I think it was actually published after. I don't know it doesn't really matter. Um, but yes, that, that that that's what made him famous. Um, but he 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 wrote many other things, and th this is a what we're discussing today is a relatively obscure and uh, relatively unimportant work from early on in his career. Uh, like I said, from 1943. Uh, just just get, giving a sort of overview for an for an educational association he was working for of Canada, Canadian history, um, what Canada is um, about, and uh, gi giving sort of some, uh, it, it gave some sort of um, hypotheses for the future of Canada. Um, and that, that we're, we're just going to be going over that, comparing it today, uh, discussing how this uh, overview is relevant um, to, to Canada today. Uh, it, it's a short work, it's only about 17 pages. Um, but that, that that's, that's, that's basically what we're doing today. And I am again joined by the uh, T.C. Jake, the Canadian Journal guys, uh, as well as Charles Redding. Now, I, I do, of course, as regular, have to start out the stream by blaming the person whose fault it is for me being late today. And that would be T.C. J. Thomas. It is his fault that we're late today. Uh, now, why is it his, his fault? Well, you see, uh, let's see. Uh, let's, let's see. Uh, about an hour and a half before this stream started, he told me that he wasn't able to uh, come on. Now, how is that relevant to us being late? Well, moving on. Um, so we, we can get just sort of get into the uh, article, I guess. Um, I don't think there's really any other preamble required. Uh, I'm going to go through some particular quotes from it that I, I think are relevant for us to discuss. But be before we do that, would anyone like to share their starting thoughts on the article and um, and any any sort of thoughts on the work as a whole? Uh, well. I think just a framing device, it might be useful to consider. So uh, if, you, if you look at the French title that is um, at the top of the PDF, at least that uh, Ryan and I were reading, it's different from the from the English title because the English title is Canada, an introduction to a nation. And then the French title, which was published a year later, is Canada has become a nation. And so one could read this sort of as the birth of a nation. Um, not to reference uh, the movie, the accidental coincidence, but 20 years on, he obviously writes Lament for a Nation. And so you have like this 20 year time span where, you know, as we'll get into it, you'll see Grant is fairly optimistic. Um, I think he reflects something of the general view of the period. He, he describes Canada's various potentialities and he expresses the sentiment that Canada will probably develop into like a major world power or at the very least an influential country. But in the span of only 20 years, he, he writes lament. And in there he's saying that, well, it's over, like the, the country's dead uh, and, you know, people might not see it yet, but like what defined the country just no longer exists. And so I think it it's going to be interesting to keep in mind the development of his thought over time. And to try and think about like what themes or what trends he was looking at that were informing the way he he thought about Canada as sort of this major Canadian intellectual in the mid twentieth century. Yeah, those those are all good points. Um, so I, I mean, I'll, I'll assume Charles and Ryan, you guys don't have anything else to add. Um, I would like to wait until after your quotes to give some of my thoughts. Okay, I, sure. I, I, I lament to know so where I think it's important to contextualize 
1943 essay with the 65 Lament for a Nation and see how his thought has developed over time. Yes, yeah, d definitely. That I think that's one of the most obviously striking things about this piece uh, is that it's very optimistic um, for Canada's future. Well, the George Grant that we're generally familiar with is a very pessimistic figure. Uh, but yeah, I, I I I can get started with um, with the first quote, and I'm I'm just going to at length read off sort of the beginning of this piece um, because I, I think it sort of sets the tone for what this piece is about. So this is going to take a little bit, but um, I'm just going to read like pr probably the first one and a half paragraphs. A person coming to Canada for the first time may well ask what kind of country has he arrived in. If he has passed through the United States on his way here, he may feel that Canadians he meets are much the same as Americans and may wonder why they don't all belong to the same country. On the other hand, when he hears God save the king so generally played and sees the Union Jack so proudly flown, he may wonder whether or not a mere, whether or not this is merely a British colony controlled from England. Let him, however, mention either of these possibilities to most Canadians, and he will be met by either anger or amusement. He will be told that Canada is neither dominated from the south by the United States, nor from the east by England, but it is a united and independent country managing its own affairs. But if he moves from place to, pl from place, to place across the country, he will not find a particularly unified uh, population, nor the kind of roots from which one would expect a nation to have grown. At w one place, he will hear people speaking French, at another English. He will see people crowding into mass in one province, while the majority go another the majority in another go to a go to the Protestant churches. At one place, he will see the factory workers and the storekeepers of a large industrial town. At another, the cowboys and farmers of the prairies. Uh, so that that that's that's it for the first quote. Um, so I mean, as you can see, th th I mean, this is a common question in both Can Canada's current affairs and Canada's history. Um, is like what unites Canada? What makes Canada like a real country? Um, why, why, why does Canada exist at all? Uh, what ties to Canada together? Um, and, and as we've been seeing, the, these, these questions have clearly been asked for a long time and they, they still are being asked, but there, there's a lot of things here, um, that I don't know, they don't necessarily sound shocking, but, um, are certainly very different from what we're used to nowadays. Um, for example, and, and this is, um, as those of you who are familiar with Grant's career will know that uh, so, some of these tensions he's talking about here are pretty much dead um, tensions today. In particular, the, the tension between is Canada really English or is Canada really American? Um, it's clear by today that the Americanist side has won a complete dominating victory. And according to Grant's own work, um, he, he outlines that as being a victory that was won uh, from 1940 to 1963. Uh, so, so when he was writing this in 1943, um, according to his later historiography, uh, th this this is a battle that was already well underway by the time he was writing this piece. Um, but he, he doesn't really um, exhibit any awareness that that was something that was going on in this piece, um, that uh, that um, that there was such a central battle for the uh, heart of the nation being waged, um, according to his later historiography. Um, but so, so what do you guys have to add to that? Uh, if I might just add... I think a, a note on the way Grant is thinking about Canada. I think it's relevant that he never actually directly answers the question of what kind of country Canada is in the essay. And I, I think this is because the essay as a whole is in some sense an answer to the question. And then it's also not really a question that you can answer from Grant's perspective. Now, this is my interpretation to be fair, but my, my general impression reading Grant is that he's very influenced by German philosophy. Uh, in particular, there's a branch of sort of philosophy that became big in continental Europe called phenomenology. And, it, you know, it's a fancy name, but essentially it just refers to not looking at big sort of questions about metaphysics and, and forms and, and uh, trying to understand the whole world as a unified system that you can sort of deduce from first principles and understand theoretically. Rather... Uh, you know, people sort of looking at uh, medieval theology and then Greek uh, philosophy decided that, that that was not really like a profitable route to, to go down. It's 
you don't really understand the world in you know total unified like theoretical terms so instead uh people who looked at phenomenology tried to understand the world uh in terms of our experiences so what what is an experience like what, what makes up an experience what is the meaning of our experiences how do experiences fit into you know who we are etc and it seems to me that grant is taking this view of canada as a nation and i think that's his understanding of nationality it's that a nation is not something you can define or a country is not something that you can define as you know a one sentence sort of thesis in answer to a research question, right? Like what kind of country is Canada? Rather, it's it's a feeling of life. It's a pattern of habits. It's a series of behaviors. It's a way of being in the world, right? And this is something that, again, German philosophy sort of gets pretty concerned with. And so, you know, in all his, you can even see in the way he describes Canada, right? Like he gives you an overview and he, and he gives you, he paints you an image of a rural, Ontario town with, you know, the farmers and the people who work in the logging industry who will go to church on Sunday. And he sort of talks about what what's meaningful to them, you know, what things are on their minds, what things sort of define their relationship to their own country. And so in this whole sort of narrative that he paints, he's sort of laying out a tapestry of life that in my view, is his actual sort of answer to the question of what kind of country Canada is. And I think that this is important when you're trying to grasp his discussion of Canada in lament and the lament for a nation later. Because if, if it is true that what's informing sort of his view of a nation and an identity and a form of life is sort of this collection of lots of little small things, little experiences that sort of compose the character of a people then that's what you're going to be looking at for what has been lost right there's not going to be necessarily uh, a unified sort of theoretical answer where you can say like this you know this piece uh, of the puzzle or this sort of element of the machinery is is what has been lost you know in terms of government or, or something like that that has ended the nation rather than the nation being the sort of uh, again, like tapestry of all these different little individual elements in human life, in direct experience, is, you know, fundamentally and irrevocably lost because of the historical confluence of events. Yeah, no, I, I think that's very well said. And, uh, and yeah, I, I agree with that most of that, that, um, uh, that there isn't like a single uh, ideological principle that you can boil down a nation to. Um, that's sort of what makes um, views like the hyper-liberal view espoused by some Americans uh, that uh, that America is just an idea. Uh, that That's what makes a, a, an idea of a nation like that being so inadequate, the idea that's purely ideological. If I can jump in here, I think there's, a, there's another element of liberalism, even to the conservative account. The, I, the idea of modern nationalism, I think, is... We talked about this before. Um, but it's still a, a departure from the more classical conception of the nation. You had a lot of multinational states where many different peoples were under one sovereign in the past, particularly in Europe, but also in, in uh, different parts of the world. <clears throat> I think Canada is very novel because it recreates that state structure in a relatively unique way in the modern world. Most states that had other nations have made pretty strong attempts to stomp them out. France did it, Italy did it, um, Spain kind of still has them, um, obviously with its independence movements internally. But Canada is interesting, and this is backed up by a Supreme Court case, which I can't recall at this exact moment, but it has explicit collective rights that are acknowledged as belonging only to specific, specific groups. So specific groups have unique relations with the Canadian crown, with the Canadian sovereign, whatever that may be contextualized as. And I think that's why Canada is an interesting proposition, because Canada is explicitly not a propositional nation. It is a state comprised of many nations who are pragmatically unified in pursuit of pragmatic political goals. They realize that membership within the Confederation is beneficial to them, and that is, that is why they are members of the Confederation. Um, which, personally, I think that's a much more honest and realistic form of politics than having these, these elaborate intellectual myths based on ideas when realistically the United States is just a continuation of 
the, the English self-conception, the Anglo-Saxon tradition with this lionization of, of Magna Carta and, and English liberty. Um, so I, I don't actually think that the idea that the United States is a, a, a nation of ideas is even necessarily true. I think that's also wrong. But the modern unified national identity that a lot of people espouse is probably also incorrect. Uh, these ideas of universal rights, so on and so forth. We, we've seen, particularly with the United States, but also in Canada, the, the idea that universal rights can be guaranteed by charters, by, by uh, constitutions, doesn't really hold up over time. Um, obviously, this is moving away from the, the, the substance of, of Grant's article, but I think that Grant in, the, in this 1943 article is make, picking up on the fact that Canada is explicitly multinational. He explicitly says, Canada, aside from the Aboriginal peoples and the Asiatic peoples of the Pacific Coast, is composed of the French, the, the British Canadians, and then the new Canadians, mostly of whom are Central and Eastern European. And that is his vision of Canada um, at that period in time. Now, obviously, that's changed a great deal. But I still think this explicit acknowledgement that Canada is a confederation comprised of different nations. The idea of a Canadian nation, there might be a meta-Canadian culture that all Canadian nations can buy into and relate to on some level. But each nation is its own distinct thing with its own unique way of life. And as the Noso noted, its own unique way of being in time. And I think that's important to note. Yeah, no, I uh, I totally agree with that. Uh, Charles, do you have anything to add? Uh, yeah, sorry. Um, you contend that we're actually built on like an explicit rejection of like the nation as proposition, like in our constitution, where you'd expect to find like uh, liberté, égalité, and fraternité, or uh, you know, life, liberty, and property in in the American Constitution. You find pog. Uh, the only guarantee you get from the state is peace, order, and good government. Um, the closest thing we get to a proposition ever is the preamble to the, the charter, which sadly is without any force. That's uh, Canada is founded on the sovereignty of God and the rule of law. So um, yeah, I would just echo Ryan. Like uh, we really aren't a propositional nation. We're just a uh, like pragmatic group of people that are mostly united by their desire to the Americans. So, sorry, um, you said we are. Are you, Did you mean we are or we are not? We are, yeah. We're mostly uh, just a group of people united by our desire to not be Americans, essentially. So we are a propositional nation? No, no, we are not a propositional nation. Okay, sorry, yeah, I got confused. No, no, sorry. Is my, is my audio okay, by the way? Or Because um, I, I have been having a little bit of uh, difficulty hearing, but... Um, uh, no, it's fine. Oh, it's fine? Okay, good. Uh, but yes, so um, so moving on, I does anyone have anything to add? I'm not, I do have more quotes here, but I need to find one. Um, because my notes are not very clean. Um, I, I could throw in, um, reading this in like today, it really feels like uh well everything to me reminds me of the wasteland but it really feels like a like the heap of broken images right like the union jack god save the king right like these things still exist and they're still present in canada but you know they're they're kind of without their force right like um you walk around to places called like wellington and like uh, dorchester or like Victoria Square here, um, and they're kind of just unacknowledged. You know, they're they're there, but they're kind of broken symbols. They don't really have the same meaning that they did when Grant was writing. You know, I, I actually, this, this is, is actually source. Oh, sorry. Oh, sorry. No. Um, you want to go first? Yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll just make it okay. quick. I actually think that's an interesting point uh, because one thing I I think I was telling Ryan after I, I read it, like the the essay was that I think Grant is generally quite perceptive in the sort of trends he notes and the different forces at play in shaping Canada. But he seems to sort of miss the sort of degree of depravity that was about to sort of emerge. Uh, like, for example, I don't know if we'll get to this later, but he, he sort of talks about well, the French Canadians retain basically their traditional form of life. They seem to be expanding across the country, but, you know, they're mostly rural, mostly Catholic. Frenchman cares, I think he says, about his farm, his family, and his church. 
And, you know, this is obviously somewhat ironic, I guess, because what would it be like 20 years on? Yeah. So like around the time he was writing Lament for a Nation, you, you're sort of getting into the quiet revolution where you see the total transformation of uh, French Canadian life in Quebec. And you, you see the shift of you know, Quebecers from being you know, one of the most conservative groups in North America to being one of the most sort of leftist societies in the world, uh, both in terms of the politics and then the uh, sort of social habits and this kind of thing. And you see similar things with the other groups he talks about. Like he does sort of acknowledge English Canada is more open to changes that are sort of affecting the cosmopolitan world order. But he, he again, doesn't seem to see uh, what would occur and, and be sort of clear by the 60s, which he does note in Lament. And, you know, all these old symbols, like the, you know, the British Empire and God Save the Queen and this stuff, this doesn't really, like, it doesn't get thrown out. So it's not a revolution in, in the sense of, like, overthrowing the sort of explicit institutions, but it's, it's just simply changing the meaning of all the symbols. And none of these none of these things were really able to sort of preserve what was actually at the core of Canadian national life. It, it, and so you just see sort of the symbols become the symbols of like a new like a new society. Uh, and so Canada just becomes like this revolutionary project. It, but uh, you know you still have the, the Queen and the, the anthem and the Union Jack at least for a little bit. But eventually that does go too. In terms of official symbols yeah no definitely um and yeah i mean that, that that's one of the most depressing parts that he speaks about in this essay is i i believe he describes quebec uh, as the most catholic nation or, uh, the most catholic area um in the world um uh and um and yeah it's just i mean as i said previously it, it doesn't seem like he perceived that um, that there was even at this point the start of a uh, battle going on that would destroy all of this, both in Anglo Canada and in uh, and in French Canada. Yeah, I mean, it just seems like he failed to foresee the arrival of the Silent Revolution. But to, to build on Charles's point from earlier, and to build on Denos's point as well, there is within Canadian academia um, a pretty strong rebuttal. Not not strong in that it is a um, a good argument, but strong as it, it is widely held, believed, and advocated for uh, amongst that demographic of Canadian academia. There's a particular example, which would be Michael Ignatieff's um, writings on the on the, the matter. For those who aren't aware, uh, Michael Ignatieff is related directly to George Grant. His mother was George Grant's sister, I believe. I, I think it would be useful to explain who Michael Ignatieff is, because I imagine we have at least a few Americans watching. Michael Ignatieff, I mean, isn't he American? He was like an yeah, American. I was gonna say like yeah, uh, he didn't come back for us, you know. Uh, yeah, um, <laughs> he kind of capitalized on on his pseudo Canadian blue blood to um, make a failed run for Canadian Liberal Prime Minister, and then went back to being an international professor um, with a little, very little attachment to Canada. Um, not a very impressive person, not a very admirable person in any meaningful sense. Had no attachment to the nation. Was purely here for self gain and prestige, but. That is neither here nor there. So Ignatiev vocalizes in his article something that is pretty common among Canadian uh, academia, where the criticism of Grant is, well, Grant, if you're if you were so correct, then why did the 1960s begin the period of, of the revival of Canadian nationalism, which was marked by Pearson and Pierre Trudeau rejecting um, a lot of things like the Vietnam War, uh, pushing forward the idea of Canadian nationalism as peacekeepers throughout the globe. Um, the, the creation of the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms, the creation of, of bilingualism. These things are all elevations of Canadian identity. Are they not? That would be the, the liberal, um, the, the academic argument against what Grant has said. I, I personally think that the arguments they gave are all vindications of what Grant has argued. The, these are all further integrations into American institutions, into American ideologies, um, and they, they further erase what made Canada distinct. Now, I, I think one of the clear frustrations of the Charter and of the later attempt with the Michelin Accords by Brian Mulroney was the attempt to further homogenize Canada and erase a lot of the, the national distinctions that we have at a sub-state level. They've obviously failed, and 
one of the interesting things that Grant actually points out in his 1943 essay is the degree to which Canada was formed not because of geography, but in spite of it. Grant notes very presciently that there are massive geological divides between the Maritimes in Ontario and Quebec, between the kind of Canadian like central hub of Ontario and Quebec and the prairies. And then the prairies are divided from British Columbia, the coast, by the massive Rocky Mountains. All of these regions are disconnected, and it would make more sense if you were thinking in pure geological terms for Canada to move or Canadian provinces to have better relations north-south than east-west. But we've managed to establish a country east-west despite of geography, which has been a very interesting development within Canadian politics. But it also points to the reality that unlike the States, unlike London, unlike Australia, unlike New Zealand, which are all part of the Anglosphere, but suffer from relatively strong central governments, Canadian central government is very difficult to pull off because of the geographical challenges. Um, Ottawa can say what it likes, but its ability to, to project power if the provinces are uncooperative is, is pretty low, to be honest. So what we see now with a lot of the provinces pushing back against um, Ottawa, I think is actually a, an interesting vindication of what Grant notes, where Canada is very difficult to centralize. Um, and if anything, I, I would, and this is, I suppose, part of my personal quest to prove Grant at least partially wrong and that Canada is not dead and is worth fighting for. Insofar as, yeah, the Canadian institutions that were around during Grant's time still have persevered and prevail against all of these changes that have occurred. And there are some fundamental parts of the Canadian superstructure that haven't been eroded despite all of the attempts that still remain and are still very Canadian. The, 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 the recent attempt by Alberta and other provinces, the recent invocations of Section 33, I think, are a really good sign moving forward of Canadian provincial autonomy and the kind of value of confederation as a relatively decentralized um, state. But that's a different discussion. Uh, yeah. Um, so moving on, um, uh, m m move, moving on to another section of the essay, he talks about, um, he, he talks about at one point, the three dominant groups in Canada, uh, which he labels as the Anglo Canadians, the French Canadians, and the, uh, and the new European immigrants. And I, I'll, I'll, I'll just quote one short section from that when he's talking about British Canadians. He says, well, the percentage of those of British origin have uh, has been declining so slowly in the Canadian population since 1870. The importance of this decline can be greatly exaggerated. People of British origin still hold the key positions in the political, business, and educational worlds and are able to wield great influence in the shaping in shaping the loyalties of their fellow Canadians. Um, and 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 then also he he says about the third group, the uh, re recent European immigrants. Uh, the third group are the new Canadians who have poured into the country in the years following 1900 when Canada was expanding rapidly. Today, they represent between one third and one quarter of the total population and are concentrated particularly in the prairies, in the prairie provinces. Ukrainians, Scandinavians, Germans, Russians, Jews, and many others have all enriched Canadian life in their own ways. The process of assimilation into the country has varied greatly with the diverse conditions encountered in different areas, but it can safely be said that as the second and third generations have grown up, uh, these new Canadians are no longer foreigners, but true Canadians. So the, the, re the reason I read those two quotes, I, I feel like this is a, another area, and I'm, you know, to be clear, I'm not... I'm not trying to like criticize Grant by saying that he got things wrong, um, but I, you know, I'm just trying to point things out uh, so we can analyze this. Um, I'm not saying I would have done any better if I was in his shoes, but I, I, I think these two uh, sections I quoted here really are some of the largest mistakes he made in this essay. Um, one, I, 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 I think it's clear that that from from the first quote that I read that um, that his optimism about the British ruling class being able to uh, form Canadians in uh, to use their power to form Canadians to maintain British traditions was a complete failure. Um, and two, I you know a, a lot of um, like actual conservatives, not members of the CPC, um, complained about immigration. And I I think this is really the stage when we have to go back to is th these uh, new Canadians from 1900 onward um, who are among my ancestors. 
um, th this really is the start of modern mass immigration. And I think he was being a bit optimistic in his assumption um, that that these groups uh, integrated as well as he believed they had. Um, and I, I really think these are some of the um, uh, s some some major um, blind sides that he had in this essay. I'd say he's partially right on the the second point, the people of British origin. Like, if you look at who the elites are in Canada, uh, the vast majority of them are literally like pool and like descendants of the original Chateau Clique or the uh, family compact in Toronto, um, who were the elites in like the 19th century. Um, oh yeah, I, I, probably, I'm not. Um, I'm not denying that there hasn't still yeah. been like an ethnic connection to the original Canadian elites. Um, mm -hmm. But I, I think what he's implying here isn't just that the um, uh, that the same families would stay in power, but that it would that it would maintain the right, same yeah. sort of Br British Canadian texture of life, which it has not. I think that's a blind spot uh, that he corrects in Lament for a Nation, right? Because uh, the Chateau Clique and the Family Compact both were very America oriented. Well, I'm, I'm less familiar with the Family Compact. Uh, as a Montreal, I'm more familiar with the Chateau Clique, but they were the like, ones behind the annexation uh, proposition. Whoa, whoa. They they wanted to uh, have Canada be annexed in the 1840s. Um, so the annexation manifesto is what it's called properly. Yeah, that, that's correct. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so I'd say he's partially correct, but there's a there's the blind spot in that like the the elites he's talking about aren't particularly attached to Britishness and weren't really even in 1940. <laughs> so one of the things I wanted to bring up regarding. Um, and I think this is more of a cultural issue. Um, but Grant is, I think, half correct when he talks about the new Canadians and their assimilation. I think one of the big problems people have, particularly on the right now, with a lot of the, let's call it woke stuff, um, is their ancestors were obliged in large part to assimilate to mostly Anglo-Canadian sentiments. Although the, like some of the Catholic diaspora particularly the Irish and the Scottish Highlanders, um, obviously integrated into the Catholic part of Canada and became French Canadian. And I think a lot of these European groups did end up assimilating and becoming Canadian and abandoning their, their ethnic traditions and ethnic heritage in a large part. Um, that was just part of the expectation. That was, that was the deal is, is you come to the country and you would assimilate. I think one of the, the issues people have now is that that compact that their ancestors were held to is no longer being applied. And, not only is it not being applied, but there are clear advantages being given um, on the basis of those who do not comply, which I, I think is a clear sticking point. The other thing I would mention is I think there's clear ethnic groups that have not or have like continued to establish um, nepotistic bases. So for example, the Ukrainian lobby in Canada is extremely strong, um, would be a good example of, of a group that's been here for a long time, but hasn't really assimilated in a meaningful way. Um, as someone that is of Italian descent, the Italian community in Canada is still uh, pretty strong for the most part and does exist. Generally, they are Italian Canadians, but the, the identity is still there. So I, I do think there, there are some select groups that while there was assimilation pressure upon them and many did assimilate, and you can talk about the nuances between Northern and Southern Italian, so on and so forth, but some did, some did not. And there are dynamics that emerge from that, that have caused complications. Moving away from purely British descending Canadians and French descending Canadians to this, this new category um, opened up a whole different can of worms where ultimately you have, we're going to have to deal with some of the ethnic issues um, of continental Europe. Well, I, I think, um, you know, I mean, I understand what you mean that obviously most of the European immigrants to Canada, uh, they, they like, you know, they, they spoke fluent English, they, uh, they adapted to Canadian culture in a lot of ways. Um, but I, I, I think the issue is that they, they never, that on mass, they never sort of gained the, um, the loyalty to historic Anglo institutions the way that, um, that Canadians would have previously held them. Um, so it, it's not, you know, it, it's not that like they all, that like they all refuse, that the Germans all refuse to learn English or something like that. Um, and it, it's not that on a surface level, um, it wouldn't that like German immigrants um, or m most continental Europeans w wouldn't have appeared to have be been integrated into Canadian society. I, I think the issue is that they never really developed the sort of intrinsic loyalty um, to Canadian institutions uh, that had existed previously. 
Um, it was just in the more obvious ways that integration happened. Um, and I, I think that's what made the sort of collapse of post-war Anglo-Canadian identity happen so quickly, um, is you had a large section of the population that wasn't really that strongly on board with um, these ideas to begin with. I think your point about institutions is somewhat interesting because arguably like the ruling institutions that sort of constituted the liberal consensus post 1960s did represent the sort of Canadian Anglo tradition. Now, obviously there's a limit to this argument, but just in terms of who it was, um, the Trudeau family, for example, would be you know, a case of people who are, you know, Canadian blue bloods, they, they're part of the sort of Laurentian elite. The Liberal Party is, you know, the Grant calls it in Lament, the National Ruling Party of Canada. It's got a long and storied history. You know, they've got all these major institutions backing them. And uh, I, I believe, my understanding is correct here, that during Pierre Trudeau's government, he was sort of seen by Anglo Canadians as sort of, you know, their guy, like a, a respected statesman who sort of stood for the kind of country that they they wanted and wanted to be part of. And conversely, um, I saw a, I believe it was, it was a sort of statistical research basically that they did looking at what sort of identifiers associated mo most closely with uh, voting for which parties in an election. And for the, for the Conservative Party of Canada vote, the most common identifiers would be essentially like Central European ethnicities like uh, German, Czech, uh, Swedish, Norwegian, you know, this kind of thing. And then Lutheran, which is just you know, the, the sort of religious denomination very common in that area of Europe. Yeah, you know, that's sort of, I, I think, in large part due to them being a, a large segment of the population out west. And that's obviously like a major sort of conservative uh, voting area. But, it, you know, it is interesting to consider the, the degree to which uh, I, I suppose the, the Canadian tradition in terms of institutions and governance has been carried on just in its like liberal form. And, you know, to what degree, you know, what, what do we understand as integration, right? So like our you know, Lutheran Germans who are voting for the conservative party, is that more integrated or less integrated than, say, like a, an old Anglo family from Montreal who are big liberal supporters? Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I, I think the fundamental problem, um, I mean, one, I mean, if you're talking about the conservatives today, um, uh, I, I, I would say the problem is that the conservatives aren't any more... Um, uh, a part of the uh, can Canadian tradition today, really, than the Liberals. Um, uh, but um, but I, I think that's really the fundamental problem with um, mass immigration at any period. That um, that just as you're talking about the, the that the texture of a nation isn't a proposition. It's it, 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 it's a bunch of different things um, integrating to a nation. Also, necessarily. It, it, it requires a bunch of different things. It, it's not um, it's not just any one principle that um, you can easily identify to uh, determine whether or not someone's really integrated. Yeah, it's it's a it's a good point. I, I, uh, I, I also I, I also would think say that I think it's a mistake to contextualize nations exclusively as a, a crystallized identity from a specific period in time. I think nations are best understood, and this goes back to your earlier point, Tenoso, that nations should be understood as a living organism. They're constantly breathing and changing and moving forwards. And I do think the, the Anglo-Canadian nation exists, and I would consider myself part of it. Um, I don't particularly have any deep ties to Italy, for example. But what I, I do think is important to note is that the way in that it exists and the way in which it manifests itself is very different than, per se, the Anglo-Canada that Grant would have grown up with. Um, despite being of the same origin and have a lot of the same priors and assumptions and ways of being, it does have differences. It has advanced in time. We we are always changing. The world is always moving. And I think one of the things that is important to note, I, I believe this is a, a Hitchens quote, um, 
but it is important to not be nostalgists. Something in our society has gone wrong, and that is what we're talking about, rather than simply the past will always be better than the present. Some something, some some decision that was made by a person who went wrong. Um, but Anglo Canada still exists, um, despite what is being said. So integration certainly it's something to be discussed, but I think there's uh, there has been a lot of integration. For example, like like Dutch farmers in Ontario, I would say are, are probably fairly integrated into the Anglo Canadian tendencies. Same with the, with a great deal of the, the Central Europeans that settled in the, the prairie areas. But again, this is this is all minutia. Um, but I, I think it's worth noting. I think these these nations are still alive um, and still breathing, and they just there, there's a, there's a tendency to focus too much on empirical definitions and strict uh, empirical confines. We want to draw boxes around all of these things. And if we can't, we assume they don't exist or are, are incoherent. But I think it's very difficult to properly define a nation in explicit terms. E even to define it in, in specific time, looking backwards is difficult. The, the ways of being, the ways of speaking, these are all surface level. It's, it's how do you engage with life how do you marry? How are your manners interacting? How do you engage with elders? And that, that change is constantly, it's always in flux because they're alive. So I, this is a little bit off topic, but I think it's worth noting. Well, I actually wanted to uh, bring up sort of an earlier point that was touched on, uh, on the question of symbols, because I think it actually ties into what you were referring to, Ryan, with the, uh, ba the bad arguments proposed by various sort of academics in response to Grant. Because essentially, I think they're all relying on the same sort of premise that if you have symbols that you know, represent something that's called Canada, um, you know, then what you have is Canadian nationalism. And I think that the nature of the sort of symbolic thinking is actually even something that you observe in Grant, that hence his point that, well, you know, we see a decline in you know, the sort of proportion of the population that is of British descent. But we have sort of British people running these various institutions, et cetera, right? This kind of symbolic representation um, in the sense that, well, there's a British person in the government, there's a British person in the corporations, there's a British person in the media. And so, it you know, rather than looking at what they're doing or what they actually believe, you're just looking at, well, they, they represent, you know, something that's proper to me. And, you know, again, I mean, sort of this question I'm not certain on is, but you see, the like uh, Charles pointed out, you, you see sort of the Anglo elites that Grant eventually acknowledges this too and lament, they, they, they take on this sort of extremely progressive sort of liberal uh, mission to transform the country. But it, you know, it retains sort of all these old symbols, right? It retains the maple leaf and the crests and the monarchy. And, you know, the, the name Canada it tries to connect itself to the history. Um, you know, you, you can read even various uh, government documents like Supreme Court cases and this kind of thing that talk about how actually, you know, the Canada's uh, state post charter is part of this long development that started with Magna Carta and led up to, you know, what we now have is our like modern liberal democracy. And, you know, th this is sort of the, the, the faulty premise of, uh, you know, Ignatieff and his, uh, you know, and his crew, I guess, of, of other academics said that the notion that Grant is wrong because, well, well because we have all these uh, cool like national symbols and like, People get really excited about, you know, see, seeing, I don't know, like a, a monarchical symbol or, or the anthem or whatever. But it's just the meaning has been totally inverse, right? You, the, the actual content of the symbol is entirely different. And, you know, the relationship of nationality to symbols is, is also another question because, true, the Anglo Canadian nation has continued. Its, its values are, are very different now. Um, it, that sort of ties into the integration question because you have well water people integrating too. And like, would you want them to integrate into this, you know, modern conception? But if they're not integrating into the modern conception, then they are in some sense not part of the nation. 
And so you, I, I think it, again, like I was saying, it's, it's unclear to me exactly how the relationship of symbols to nationality works in every case, but I think symbolic thinking, you, you can sort of see it leading people down these, these false trails. I actually think that's an interesting observation. We were speaking recently about how Remembrance Day is probably one of the last meaningful rituals, public rituals um, that commemorate uh, old Canada and are still engaged with widely by um, by Canadians. Whereas a lot of the other symbols of Canada have been uh, either done away with, uh, the Red Ensign, for example, um, the Canadian government isn't updating any of the money or really promoting uh, Charles III as the King of Canada in any meaningful way. Um, but then you have the the maple leaf and the bars, the red bars that are taken as this, this symbol of universalism as post-nationalism, at least by the, the government. This is their explicit statement in their academic writing. So the symbols are valuable, though I would wonder if Symbols and aesthetics are how the majority of people engage with politics because it's an efficient heuristic for them to digest ideology and rhetoric um, in a very immediate way. Like for, for example, the, the prevalence of, of, I don't want to go into like an accurate discussion of memes, but I think it's, it's, it's worth noting, the, the way in which kind of graphic, uh, graphical representations of ideas become so popular is because they disseminate ideas very quickly and very effectively without saying a lot of words. It's not hard to just a meme when it's like an ugly person and an attractive person and the attractive person is saying your idea. You're like, oh, wow, that, that like makes sense. Like, isn't that great? So I, I think that it's very easy to hijack symbols because people will still intuit them as perhaps something different, um, which, which is why, and, and certainly the, the monarchy is important, but I think people support the monarchy and then turn around and talk about being um, like right-wing socialists or um, Fabians or whatever, um, things of that nature that become pseudo common in, in red Tory or high Tory circles. Um, oh, not, not that these are, are meaningful factions in Canadian politics, but it's, it's still the intellect of tomorrow's youth is, is important to understand for the, the beliefs of tomorrow's kind of working elite. If I might add, there was a, something of a funny example of exactly what you're talking about uh, today, actually, uh, with the Canada versus Croatia game, because uh, after Canada scored its, uh, its its goal during the match, uh, I don't know which publication it was, but uh, some Canadian publication released uh, the image with with the headline, you know, this heritage moment. And the, the Canadian team, I think, is significantly I, I don't remember exactly like what the proportions are but the canadian sort of uh, soccer team is composed significantly of uh, people who are immigrants or the children of immigrants and so the sort of subtext there was like yeah canadian heritage is you know this these uh these immigrants who sort of become canadian and then now look they're representing our country on the world stage uh now that didn't turn out so well obviously um croatia won that game so you know maybe a strategically bad play by you know, this Canadian publication, but, you know, regardless, it's, it's sort of a, a rather striking contrast to see all that represents, right? Like the, the notion of Canadian heritage that like, uh, you know, Samuel de Champlain, like landing on the shores of the St. Lawrence is, is sort of the equivalent of, you know, someone wearing the Canadian uh, soccer uniform, you know, who's like, has not really any connection to the historical nations of Canada. And then, you know, all, they're wearing the logos of various corporations that are celebrating like pride month or whatever, you know? Um, and yeah, I think, I think you're right, Ryan. Like it, it, it's sort of like, it's easy to hijack this kind of stuff because it, like for a lot of people, this is sort of a, a simple and sort of accessible way of relating to politics. And so, you know, conservatives often do this, right? The, they love their country. That's sort of what part of being conservative is. And so you see a maple leaf on something, you get excited, you, you like sports, right? You're watching the team. And so that's why, you know, they'll, they'll show you this heritage moment, right? You know, Canada's Canada's heritage is, is defined by all these values of like multiculturalism and social progressivism. And it's all wrapped up in a maple leaf. And so suddenly you have uh, people celebrating what they would have opposed maybe 10 years ago.
uh, and I, I guess I would point out that this this again the 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 necessity of interpretation regarding symbols ties into our perhaps the right wing belief in a necessity of hierarchy. Symbols are important, ideas are important, but I think there is going to inevitably need to be people that interpret the symbols that that create the symbols. And regardless of your social structure, there is going to be a class that interprets the symbols. Yeah, no, I mean it's um, it's nice that these uh, that uh, tra traditional Canadian symbols continue to exist, um, but they they generally don't have the same uh, meanings that they used to have. Uh, like I, I just saw a discussion on Twitter about this earlier about the Canadian flag and how the modern Canadian flag, how um, uh, how the red and white are, you know, traditional Canadian colors, uh, St. George's cross, you know, all that type of stuff. And yeah, that, 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 that's fine, but that's not how most Canadians understand it. Um, they, they understand it as, you know, as you guys have said, as a symbol of progressive values or as a symbol of, uh, peacekeeping, um, as a symbol of modern Canada, they don't understand it, um, as something related to the Anglo Canadian tradition. Um, so it, it's not particularly relevant um, if you can sort of trace a, uh, a, a, an even accurate genealogy if that's not how these symbols are being presented to the public. Yeah, I mean, I, I like the Canadian flag. I'm not going to like bash it. Um, it means yeah. No, I mean, to, I mean to be clear, I'm not. You know, I'm, I'm not saying yeah. I hate the modern Canadian flag. Like I, I've well, like when I played in like high school and such, the Canadian flag was what we played under when we played foreign tournaments, like things of that nature. So yeah, the, the Canadian flag is mine, and the Canadian flag I think was partly claimed by the convoy, for example. So it is certainly not a uh, uniformly liberal symbol, though I, I would say it definitely leans heavily in that direction. No, I mean, I you know, the, the, this, this is a um, <laughs> th th this this is a classic thing I remember hearing growing up that like, oh, like you know, if you're an American, and you go to Europe, you should like put a Canadian flag on your backpack because that way they'll know you like support gay marriage or something. See, now they'll know you support the Dutch farmers, our uh, international brothers in the uh, proletarian struggle. <laughs> yeah, so definitely something that's worth considering um, regarding Canadian politics in general is. Things have definitely changed. Canada remains British North America, but I do think that British North America is something that is distinct from Britain. The the the, the temperament of the people in Canada is distinct, in my opinion, at least in my experience, having traveled many times to both places, is distinct from the Americans and from the British. It is its own thing, formed by its own history and its own geography, and all that that entails. And I will never have the intellectual heft to precisely place that in a glass jar, but I, I know it exists and I know some of the elements that constitute it. And I think that's important to acknowledge. But Much like moved, Kenneth Clark. I think, we, I think we've moved away from the George Grant 1943 uh, essay a little bit. Well, I was going to add that just uh, you're, you're in you're in sort of the same school as Kenneth Clark when he opens the Civilization series. He asks, well, what is civilization? And he says, I can't define it, but I know it when I see it. And then uh, that's how he sort of introduces the show. So uh, yeah, I, can, I can't define it, but if I'm hanging out in Moose Jaw, like I'm, I'm going to be able to point, point out people that are I'm like, yeah, that guy's probably Canadian. Oh, I should say that's also, I don't notice when, I'm, when I'm like at airports, you know, like uh, run into people and they're also Canadian immediately. I can tell. And there's like, uh, like I'd say like a camaraderie between us, you know, guy in line buying a sandwich he's like oh, yeah i'm from st john's and we hit it off immediately like there's definitely something there um yeah i mean it, it's uh i guess not to get too much into like german philosophy again but it's sort of like seeing yourself in other people this kind of uh the, the development of uh the self-conception sort of emerges through the development of the national conception and all that um I should say though, like I, I actually I don't know, um, Settlers Lament, if you wanted to, um, like go through some other quotes, but I did have something to refer to regarding uh, the sort of shift in politics that is described, like the way Grant describes Canadian politics in this, like 40, 1943 essay, versus the way he describes Canadian politics in Lament for a Nation. Uh, yeah, sure. Go ahead. I mean, I, I, I did have other notes and stuff, but uh, honestly, everything else, that I was, all the other quotes that I had have already been 
the the essence already been discussed. I don't feel like there's much of a point in reading them out. Okay. Um, so yeah, I think um, so actually this sort of ties back to our discussion of nationhood. But I, I think sort of what was interesting to me is what Grant describes as Canadian politics in the 1943 essay is very much just a British sort of parliamentary political system, very standard. Uh, he says. You have the two traditional parties, which are the conservatives and the liberals, but there's really not much of a difference. The main difference is the liberals are against tariffs and they want some more independence for Canada within the Commonwealth. And the conservatives are for tariffs and they want Canada to sort of stick more closely with the imperial government in London. And, you know, he says some of the economic troubles had given rise to the, I think, cooperative Commonwealth Federation, CCF, uh, which I believe later developed into the NDP. And he says, but overall, you know, the politics aren't really too contentious. Honestly, the parties don't even really have well-defined ideologies because they're all big tent parties. They want to appeal to as many people as possible. And so their main goal is to not be too offensive. He does say that with the end of the war, parties will have to develop more firm, sort of uh, crystallized ideological positions in order to deal with the coming crisis, which sounds a bit ominous, though he was definitely correct, uh, both in the sense that politics became more contentious in the decades, sort of uh, following the writing of this essay, and also that Canada did indeed face sort of multiple crises. It So I think I think it's interesting that by the time you get to Lament for a Nation, he's describing politics in these existential terms, right? That the liberals represent subjugation and death, and that the conservatives under Diefenbaker were sort of like this last hope for uh, Canadian civilization. And I, it, to me, at least, that sort of mirrors mirrored the uh, sort of death of consensus politics in from the early 21st century to the rise of populism. Uh, that we're seeing now, uh, populism sp- specifically from the right. I should be, uh, I should sort of specify there. Uh, you stunned me with your brilliance. Uh, yes, uh, definitely that is, uh, that's something I noticed is very striking, the, the way that, as you said, uh, in this essay, he notes the... Um, or he, he describes the liberals and conservatives as being basically the same, which, um, I, again, it's not just that um, he believes that changed afterward. Um, I, sorry, I'm, I'm getting a note that my mic is static. Is it still bad? It's it's sort of staticky. I mean, it's it's not too bad. Uh, I, I guess one other thing I would add is, is it's sort of, in, in my view, the birth of a culture war or like the culture war. I think that's what he's getting at is the fight over the definition of the nation. So politics moves from being, um, I would say, maybe about specific political issues, and it becomes a question of pre-political issues. So it's not about policies. It becomes about who we are, um, you know, what the role of a person is in the society. How should we understand ourselves in relation to the universe? You know, these kind of really big questions which maybe you don't see addressed explicitly, but I think that's basically what's happening when politics becomes more contentious and populist and you get these sort of culture war dynamics. Um, and these issues sort of are pre-political, like the questions of family, faith, you know, nationhood. These kind of things in a sort of normal society are, are just assumed. And, you know, politics just is just a way to serve these various elements of human life. But sometimes in times of crises, you have that these become sort of live questions like should we have families should we have faith uh, should we have a nation right and that to me is no longer a political str- struggle in the normal sense it becomes a struggle about the sort of very foundations of politics themselves so th- that the answer to these questions will define all politics uh, rather than you know a, a political victory in a normal time just meaning that your preferred tariff policy goes through. You find that in Grant too. Like I think he says this in Technology and Empire. Um, liberalism can't answer ontological questions. Um, so we always 
will end up at like you know what is a woman as a as a woman, right like well i don't know uh it's a person and they say they are a woman or whatever the case is and then the the best right liberal answer is like well you appeal to biology which um just creates the opening for like a technical solution to that but that's also off the rails uh but yeah um that we are getting to like pre-political questions is something that grant does pick up later and uh also i think like without doubt is uh where we're at right now and, and perhaps it's a vindication of his thesis regarding that of canada because if we are negotiating pre-political questions then the very foundation of our political union the confederation becomes something totally transient if if we don't even know what we are like, how, how can we know like what we are fighting against like if we we can't decide as a culture and there's still some element of not wanting to be american sure but to what degree does that kind of survive the coming crucible where whole sections of our society just completely hate the other section and are willing to use pretty aggressive means to do so you have the alberta sovereignty movement um whether that ends in independence or not is a whole different thing you have the, the liberals um sending pretty significant force against um protesting citizens so on and so forth so there's definitely been an escalation and then the rhetoric employed by the by the different aspects of the political spectrum seems to be irreconcilable i i don't see how a middle ground can be reformed um in the absence of some kind of existential conflict where one side dominates the other um as i suppose where i see politics going in the near future probably less so in canada because the canadian right wing uh, at least at the, the retail level seems to be pretty inept but there, there's certainly a lot of sympathy towards the american right wing um within kind of the the commons of, of the canadian right the PPC rising would be a, a good example of that, despite Maxime Bernier pretty clearly being incompetent and his party having pretty poor policy, they do capture a lot of the sort of American-esque uh, energy that appeals to certain sections of the Canadian right. I mean, th this might be sort of a, a bit too off topic, so you know, please feel free to correct me, but I, I think, uh, you know, part of the turning of politics to the existential pre-political questions uh, is the sort of secondary effect that society in general just becomes like a total clown show, uh, like a carnival. Um, you know, actually, if you look at like sort of historical traditional carnivals like Mardi Gras and, uh, you know, various carnivals in Europe, you know, people wearing masks and costumes and dressed in all these sort of weird clothing and you have all this sort of otherworldly imagery. Um, you know, the point is there's sort of like a side to life that's a bit, you know, it gets more confused and then things just get weird. And I, I think that's sort of similar to what's happening now. I mean, that's actually how I see a lot of the sort of PPC, like Americanized Trump stuff is it, it's yeah, it's almost like this sort of carnival type thing where people are now dressing up as like, I guess, Trump supporters. <laughs> you know, you're just celebrating the politics of another uh, of another country. Um and, you know, you, you have on the left, I guess people think that they're living in like the 1930s, like industrial slums or whatever in Europe, and they're going to do a revolution. And, you know, so everyone's sort of, because there's not this solid base of, of you know, knowing the answer to the existential pre-political questions, everyone's sort of gone off the rails a little bit. And, and you start to see like this really strange sort of phenomena in society. But, uh, you know, I, I think maybe uh, our, our politics is like one of one of those sort of phenomena anyway. Though. Well, I mean, Sorry. I think the reason for the uh, state of Canadian political discourse being like that. So, sorry, um, is my mic fine now? Is there any static? You're good. OK. Um, yeah, I, I think the reason for Canadian political discourse being like that is just a I think it's primarily a result of hyper Americanization in Canada that um that the categories that canadians are trained to think in i mean like you know if you're a normal um like average um person nowadays like where are you going to get exposed to politics or you probably the internet 
um, and you're probably not going to be mostly watching Canadian stuff. You're prob you're probably not even going to be specifically you know checking out Settlers Lament um, or even checking out uh, an American equivalent or something. Um, you're probably just going to have like an Instagram or Facebook or you know depending on if you're a boomer or, um, or your age or whatever. Um, you're just going to have some sort of social media, and you're going to wh whether left wing or right wing, you're going to be watching. Um, you're 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 going to be getting American um, politics um, shoved down your throat all day long, and especially since we we all speak English, you're not going to, um, uh, you, you know, you're, it, it, if you had a language barrier, then you're going to be seeing a lot more stuff relating to your own country because it's in your own language. But since we all speak English, you're specifically going to be seeing tons of American stuff, um, and it's just the the categories that we're trained in. Um, uh, our, our American categories because of this, uh, the mass prevalence of American media. And it doesn't matter whether or not you're personally someone that's tuned into American politics. Um, if you're just watching sort of like normie uh, uh, you, YouTube content, like makeup tutorials, they're probably going to mention that like, oh, did, did, did you hear that like Roe v. Wade is overturned? And uh, now th th we have like the death penalty if you um, have a miscarriage. Um, and it's, and I, and I hear this stuff a lot where um, I'll talk to normal Canadians and they'll say like, oh, uh, abortion's illegal in Canada now. It's like, no, no, it's not. Def definitely did not happen. I mean, abortion's not illegal in the U.S. either. It's illegal in a few states. Um, but um, but it, it's just that it's just our our politics is dominated by Canadian discourse. So, uh, or by, by American discourse. Um, and I, I I think that's the main reason that like you know when when, when Canadians wanted to rise up against. Um, uh, 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 against um, stuff that the Trudeau government was doing. That's why it's all done through an American lens, um, because that, that th those are the categories that conserve Canadians are used to at this point. Um, and similarly, when left wingers want to do left wing political activism, uh, the only categories that they're really used to are uh, left wing American categories. I will say one sort of nice effect of the, uh, I guess, political warping is that. Uh, you see lots of maple leaves in uh, the Netherlands. Uh, people sort of using that as a symbol of freedom. So, uh, you know, there's a silver lining to postmodernist world. Uh, I mean, I don't think it's even that hard to change. We were looking at public opinion polls um, over over decades um, recently um, in our kind of pre-show chat, and it, it's it's pretty interesting how quickly opinions can be changed just by a slight change in elite rhetoric and some slight changes to media. Like I, I really do think people um, overestimate how um, deeply ingrained most of these beliefs are. As as early as, as the nineteen yeah, I mean, I mean, I, I sort of huge parts I mean, of Canada were opposed to abortion. How Morgan Toller was literally incarcerated and found guilty multiple times for his his grievous acts. Um, so I, I I'm very skeptical. Um, about these things. I, th I think the the current elite of Canada don't really have any meaningful beliefs beyond post-nationalism. They might have some education in the history of Canada, but I, I doubt that as well. Um, I would be very surprised if Christia Freeland could lecture you in, in any length about kind of any meaningful Canadian history or philosophy beyond Brian Mulroney, but that's neither here nor there. So yeah, th th there's no elite that are willing to lead away from the states. So you just have everyone in Canada preoccupied with the Americans. Um, but that could be very easily changed. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I definitely agree that um, I think that's one of the clear things from social change that have happened over the past um, century, that attitudes on many things can change rapidly. Um, I mean, I, 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 I do think the degree to which these things affect you directly um, counts also. I, I think that's why, you know, for, for example, um, attitudes in most Western countries against immigration. Um, no, you're much definitely blowing up right now. Okay, <laughs> okay sorry. Yeah, I, 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 I have earphones in, so I, I, that was uh, that was loud. Um, yeah, I thought I thought uh, there was sorry, an explosion going on over there. Okay, I was uh, like, now, oh, now you're good. <laughs> yeah, you're fine now. Sorry, continue. Uh, yes. Um. So I, I think that's why, like, you know, g g generally speaking, in most Western countries, there's usually pretty popular um, anti-immigration sentiment. Um, because it's something that affects people a lot more directly. Um, but, you know, on, on these, like, you know, mainstream hot-button issues, abortion, gay marriage, um, especially gay marriage, where um, 
I remember AA did um, a while ago, a couple of years ago, a, a video in response to a another YouTuber who had um, claimed that the 80s in the UK was the gay decade. Um, and that th th this, this was just blatantly false, that in the 80s, the vast majority of British people believed that um, that sodomy was a sin. Um, the, the vast majority of people did not... Um, uh, we're, we're, we're not okay with it back then. Um, and if, uh, today, of course, that's the exact opposite. Um, but he, he was just doing that as like a way to emphasize a point of how like e e even the historiography we have of this can change our mind so rapidly. Um, but sim similarly, I mean, there, there's no reason why if we can have such radical opinions foisted on us in such a short amount of time, that couldn't change back. Um, if we... Um, uh, if the um, controlling, um, if the controllers of um, uh, uh, of the important institutions wanted to have a different view, uh, the 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 issue is, I I think just that I I don't see any reason to suppose um, that the elite in Canada or the elite in many countries are going to change their opinions on this anytime soon. Yeah, I, sh I should also add. I think that so alongside the elite driven portion of social change, I think there's also an organic element that I would ascribe mostly to sort of the moral condition of a people. Um, it's just that, you know, these things go uh, in, in, in waves, like they come and go. Sometimes there are more moralistic eras. Sometimes there are eras where there's more moral laxitude, but, you know, I, th I think our era is definitely one that's defined by sort of, um, a, a decline in the sort of popular sense of morality. And insofar as there is sort of a, a moralistic attitude from the left, I would say it's of a different quality in the sense that for, for sort of many people, it, it's not like a commitment to sort of a, a, an actual moral society. It's just sort of like a self-interest thing. Like I just, I just want to be able to you know, experience X pleasure or something like that. Or like, I want to be able to do, you know, whatever I want, this kind of thing. No, it's not always true. You know, there are sort of like committed, um, you know, leftists who, who really do want to change the world and all that. But I, I would say just in general, like um, the, the loss of a moralistic society is, is a major sort of inciting incident for the change. And I, I think that, for a sort of permanent restoration of like a, a normal sort of decent society, then it will need sort of a re-edification of the moral character of the nation. Uh, yes, so true. Um, so, uh, I don't. I don't really have much more to add. Uh, I'm, I'm hearing that uh, some of you guys have to go soon. So if, if you guys don't have anything else to add, we can wrap it up. Yeah, I think we can start the wrap up and just give final thoughts. Okay. Uh, so d does anyone have any f final thoughts they'd like to put out? Uh, I, I suppose I'll, I'll start. I, I think the transformation of Grant's thoughts between 1943 and 1965 is pretty prophetic. Um, despite criticism, Grant's writing in 1965 remains true, and a lot of the insights that Grant had in 1943 demonstrate how rapidly Canada changed over that period of time. And was it wasn't by no means predestined or inevitable, as I think some people might assume, but was the product of a great deal of, of decision-making that prompted Grant to um, really despair um, and, and write the book that he ended up writing. Regarding... Grant's ideas in 1943, yeah, Grant was correct. Canada is not a, a nation state. Canada is not a, a nation of ideas. Canada is a confederation of different peoples that are brought under the same flag for the pursuit of pragmatic ideas. That, that's at least my understanding from, from my learning of Canada. Grant was correct in that our elites, um, both political, um, media, and economic, have been subsumed into the American, not only economic system, but ideological system as well. Uh, something that is similar to something similar is happening to Canada, Canada at large. The perhaps light at the end of the tunnel would be that despite all of the assimilation, um, a lot of it deliberate uh, into the American sphere, into the, the, the continental system, as Grant would have called it, the, the Canadian strata, the idea that 
Canada cannot be centralized because of its geography, its vast ethnic differences, so on and so forth. Those systems remain despite um, the the antics of Ottawa. And I, I do think that's heartening that the, the spirit of Canada um, manifest in the convoy, in the Albertan um, sovereignty assertions recently. I think those are actually good signs for the future of Canada and the preservation of the Confederation as a collection of sub-state pseudo-autonomous provinces. Uh, yeah, no, I, uh, I, I agree with, uh, with much of that. Um, and yeah, I mean, as, as you said, I, I, I think this essay from 1943 is, um, uh, does, does really sum up a lot about Canada and that, uh, that though, I mean, you know, I've, I've already expressed some disagreements. I, I think it is still basically a good introduction to the, um, history and, uh, then contemporary issues in Canada. And for that matter, m many of the issues he discusses about, um, uh, the, uh, the geography and ethnic, uh, divisions within Canada, um, e even though a lot of the realities that has changed, um, it still speaks to present day, uh, divisions, um, I, it still is a it works as a pretty decent instruction. Uh, Charles and Denoso, do either of you have anything else to add? Uh, I suppose just shortly, I would say Grant played the role of a Cassandra during the mid 20th century for Canada, though I suppose unlike Cassandra, he had to suffer the indignity of having his uh, prophetic vision denied even after he was proven right by events. But I think that there's also a lot of positive elements to take away from Grant, uh, a lot of which we discussed here. And, you know, I, I think ultimately his sort of optimism in that, that he lays out in the first sort of 1943 essay is and was founded at the time, geographically, uh, temperamentally, historically, Canada has a lot of advantages. There's, you know, a lot going for it. And, you know, were we as a country to fix like the, the sort of institutional issues that act as sort of this, uh, this terrible weight, you know, dragging the whole country down, then Canada could still have, you know, the future that uh, optimistic Grant predicted for it. So true. Uh, Charles, do you have anything to add? Uh, not really much to add. I did want to touch a little bit on, um, he writes about uh, the idea of getting away to the shield. Um, and I wanted to close with, uh, this is something that we've lost, the idea of going away to Algonquin Park to paint uh, and fish and be away from the city for a few days. Uh, and so, uh, Revolt against the modern world, uh, go camping, um, but also like broadly in agreement. Um, we can definitely return to white pilled Grant. Uh, you know, I don't. I don't think our nation is dead, and I think in spite in spite of the changes that have happened since uh, forty three and even since sixty five, you know. Uh, Nothing's inevitable. We can always go back. Well, not go back, but you know what I mean. Restore the the original idea. Yeah. Um. So yeah. I mean, just uh, to close, I guess you guys should uh, sell sh shill the Canadian Journal. Just to briefly respond to Charles, we can't go back, but we can go forward. But um, yeah, thank you very much for having us on. Again, we always appreciate being guests on the show. It's always a very interesting discussion. Um, yeah. We are from the Canadian Journal, which is a small publication that discusses Canadian history, philosophy, and politics um, in depth. You can find us at thecanadianjournal.com, on YouTube as the Canadian Journal, or on Twitter at Journal Canada. We're also on Facebook, and then the podcast is on Spotify and Spreaker as well. I think that's everything we have. Yeah, I, I yes, it, uh, the, and the Canadian <laughs> Journal is very good. I'd highly recommend everyone to check it out, subscribe. Uh, favorite to the web page, all that stuff. Uh, I, I I have the YouTube channel, the um, the website and the Twitter account all linked in the description.
Uh, so please, please do, especially if you're Canadian, check them out. There really isn't that much good uh, conservative Canadian content out there. Um, so, you know, gotta, gotta support it well, uh, well we can. Um, but yeah, I mean, that's, that's basically it, um, for today. Thank you everyone for joining us and God save the King.